Hello everyone, welcome to the Butterfield Alpacas and Fiber Arts Podcast. This is episode 6. I cannot believe it is episode 6. I feel like it should be episode 60. But hey, it's episode 6. So welcome back to all of you who are returning viewers and a special welcome to those of you who are finding me for the very first time. I am Tasha Butterfield, an alpaca rancher, crochet instructor, knitter, and lover of anything yarny. You can find my alpacas at Butterfield Alpaca Ranch in Southern Nebraska and also Butterfield Fiber Arts on Etsy. All of my social media links I have put here. So you'll find me on Instagram, Twitter, Ravelry, and Facebook. There's also a Ravelry group for this podcast. You can find the link to the Ravelry group down in the show notes, which is in the description box. Also, at the top of the show notes, you will find timestamps for the whole episode. Every segment and topic that I bring up, I like to give you timestamps so that you can skip around and watch topics that you find interesting and can avoid the ones that you may not really be interested in because I cover a lot of different topics. You can also find the show notes in the Ravelry group. Each episode has its own thread. You're welcome to leave comments here on YouTube but also over on the Ravelry group, so wherever you like to have discussion, you can choose either platform. In this episode, we're going to start off by going out to the ranch, and I'm going to talk about the male berserk syndrome, which is something that can happen to alpacas and llamas, and we're all, I'm also going to show you what they do when they graze, when they, what the alpacas do when they graze. It was uh, I was out there, and it was late in the day and the sun was setting and the alpacas are so relaxing. They are such a de-stressor from life. I love them. I really, really love them. <laughs> then we're going to head right on out to the Shepherd's Mill. This week I took a batch of my alpacas fiber down the Shepherd's Mill to be made into yarn and so I filmed the whole thing and got to take a tour and show you what it's like for a mill to create yarn. We go through the whole process from checking fiber in all the way till the end product of yarn. Um, and that's all I'm going to say <laughs> right now, except that there were times in the tour in which the machine noise was so loud, it was hard to hear Sally's voice, and Sally was the owner who was giving the tour, so I have included some subtitles in that. I didn't subtitle the whole thing, just the parts that I thought would be difficult for you to hear. Then we are going to talk about machine knitting. Yes. So last week I had talked, in episode 5, I had told you that I had this item, I had started to hand it, and I wanted to complete it faster and realized it was a good candidate to put on my knitting machine and complete faster. It's a gift, I want it done sooner than later <laughs> for them and for me so I can move on to other things. So I thought it was a good opportunity to kind of talk about machine, knitting machines, what they are, how they work, where you find them, why you might be interested in them, and also some stigmas related to them. Then I will finish up in TV strings and things and show you what I've been doing in my personal fiber art creations. Before we go to the ranch, I wanted to talk about a couple things I brought up in last episode. One was the giveaway. I'm giving away two skeins of alpaca yarn that I carry in my shop. Um, I don't have them to show you here right now. Um, if you're curious, if you haven't heard about it and you're curious, go back to episode five where I talk about it in detail. But um, we are now at 279 subscribers. So we are almost, almost there. And we're over halfway there from last episode. It is very likely that I'll be able to draw a winner this week when we reach 300 subscribers. So I'm hoping next episode I'll be able to reveal the winner. And if you haven't heard about this, the way it's working is you need to like this video. In order to enter the giveaway, you need to like the video, either this one or episode five. You need to share the podcast with people, and it can be in any of your social media platforms. It could be in person, just anywhere, really. And then leave a comment telling me where you shared the podcast. So you can comment here on this video, 
or you can comment over in the Ravelry group where I have a thread just for the giveaway. When we reach 300 subscribers, I will draw a winner. And then that winner will receive two skeins of alpaca yarn in their choice of color or colors. They want two different colors. And that person will be all set for the alpaca cow. And I had asked you in last episode if you'd be interested in doing a cow. I didn't know this early in a podcast if it was a good time to do a cow. Um, but I wanted to ask and see what kind of reception there was. And sure enough, there was a number of you who said, yes, 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 I want to do a cow. Um, some of you already had alpaca yarn and you didn't quite know what to do with it. So it's just stayed in your stash. Um, and there's others of you who have never owned alpaca yarn, never worked with it, and thought this was a great opportunity to give that a shot. So, I'm going to say the alpaca cow is a go. And we're going to start at June 1st and have it go for two months. So June 1st to August 1st is my projected time for the cow. Um, and June 1st because I... I want to tell, tell you about alpaca yarn, how to choose it, how to choose a pattern for the type of yarn that you have, or vice versa. If you have a pattern, you want to make sure you have the right alpaca yarn for it, um, and also where to buy it. And there's not going to be enough time in this episode to go over all those things because I really want you to understand what makes alpaca different so that you can make the right choices in purchasing your own yarn and in choosing the pattern that goes with the yarn or vice versa. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do that in next week's episode. And that will give you three weeks in which to purchase your alpaca yarn and your pattern or choose your pattern, however you want to do it. So June 1st, you'll be all ready to go. And for those of you who that might not be enough time, I'm thinking it would be enough time to order. Um, even if you're not in the U.S., I would expect that you're getting alpaca not from the U.S., but more local to you. So if there's any issues with that, you know, the end date for the Cal is flexible. I just thought in all likelihood for what you're going to make with alpaca yarn, two months was probably sufficient. I don't know. I guess we'll have to see once people really decide on their project. Um, and then if a number of you feel like August 1st is too soon, then we'll push the deadline back and that's fine. We'll just kind of play it by ear. But I do want to give or have a giveaway for those of you who participate in the Cal. And I already have some ideas and I can't, it's a surprise. I can't publicly say it yet, but certainly by August 1st, I will be able to. Oh, hopefully June 1st, but I don't think so. Sometime during the Cal, I will be able to reveal what I can give away. So just know that it is something very special and that you will want it. Okay, now let's head on out to the ranch and get going. I've been here for a while now. The plan was to come and halter Kino, have a halter right here, and put him in a stall in the girls' barn for the night. Because in the morning, I have it set to bring him to a petting zoo at one of the area daycares. I was asked to do this a few weeks ago. And Kino is the perfect alpaca to do that with. He is gelded. So he doesn't have any of them extra hormones to make him unruly in any way. He was a bottle baby pretty much. His mom did not produce enough milk. So he was a bottle baby. And that made him very friendly. One of the things that can happen with alpacas and llamas is something called the berserk syndrome. And that happens especially with males, more so males than females, but can happen to both. But it happens when a baby is overhandled by people. As you can imagine, baby alpacas are very, very cute. Very sweet. What have we got here? Got some 
Want to know what's up? Best spider. And then Vinny's behind him. Yeah. <laughs> Vinny doing his job, checking out what's going on. <laughs> but, yes, as you can imagine, baby alpacas are very cute. And people want to play with them and make them super friendly. Pretty much overhandle them. There is a natural... How do I want to say fear of people, of course? And you want to handle them enough where they're used to people and they're not wild. But overhandling them removes any fear or respect that they have for people. Which means that there's no boundary. They will just push and be dominant. They will try to dominate all people. That is never a good situation. And um, it does not create a good quality of life for any alpaca or llama because no one wants them. They tend to turn wild. It's turning warmer now. I can take my hood off. They tend to turn wild because no one's handling them, no one cares for them, um, and if the behavior is not checked, they might end up being put down because they can't be handled. So the there is this fine line when you are raising the babies, especially the boys, to not overhandle them. You want to make them friendly, but you don't want to overhandle them so they grow up and have this... Um, no boundary with people kind of situation. That berserk syndrome where they want to be all aggressive towards you. Okay, I'm talking about that because I was talking about Kino. Because he was a bottle baby, naturally he was handled more than other babies would have been. And um, he got to an age where he was starting to act a little more aggressively. Uh, or at least enough more aggressively for it to be a concern. So one of the things that you can do to reduce the aggression in the males is to gelt them. And that is why Kino is gelded. Even though he has a fabulous fiber, I think he has the best fiber of all of my boys, to be honest. He had to be gelded because or else he could not have been handled. And I'd I didn't geld him, but, you know, a friend of mine did, and that she raised him. That was her choice, um, and I'm sure she made the right choice because you would, it's better to choose to sacrifice their ability to have Kriyas over their quality of life in the long run. And so, in Kino's case, it was the right choice to geld him. Now, unfortunately, with Kino, you pretty much have one small window of opportunity to catch him and halter him if that's what you want to do. I missed that window today. And now he's way off. He's probably about 100 feet from me right now and walking away. He keeps going further and further away. So I am not going to be able to take him to that petting zoo in the morning. Um, I have to be there at 9, which means if I wanted to choose to catch him in the morning, I have to be here very early. I have to still attach the trailer to the pickup. I can't do that over uh, early because I don't live where the trailer is, and I wouldn't want to attach the trailer, take it home, which is 9 miles away, then bring it back in the morning. That just seems like a lot of work. Um, all for something that might not happen now at all. But thankfully, I was already told um, by the person who uh, asked me to bring an alpaca to this petting zoo that there is another alpaca coming. So the petting zoo will still have an alpaca even if I can't bring mine. I am going to turn the camera around now because the boys are getting playful. So let's look at that. I'm sure the lighting is not very ideal. The sun is pretty low. 
see it there. And so the lighting is coming from the other direction. <laughs> so you can't see the definition of the boys very well, but this is one of the times of day when they get a little more feisty, there's a little more energy. Now Kino has made his way back, partly. Now because of the sun, it's hard for me to show you. Where's my finger at? Right there. That white guy right there. That is Kino. I thought, well, maybe if I sit here long enough, I might get another opportunity to halter him. It's pretty decent out right now. This whole week has been cool. So it's not, you know, super ideal weather, but the wind is light. So I'm not cold. And I'm kind of thinking I have lost my chance to halter Kino. Oh well. Like I said, the petting zoo will still have an alpaca, even if it's not mine. So beautiful. Shall we take a walk with him? They're not used to me being out here with them. At least not in this area. They're used to me being by the barn. Okay, there's Kino. You gonna let me hold you now? Thor wants to play. Thor is one of my most playful boys. He'll just play with anybody. Thor is the one on the right there. Shaman, chillax in there. This rolling is something that alpacas do frequently. It's actually part of their hygiene. Rolling in dirt is part of their hygiene. Which is the main reason that we wash their fiber when we process it. All that we're washing out is the dirt. But they do this rolling in the dirt uh, for the same reason many other animals do. Like for bug control and cleaning off other stuff like spit that might have gotten on them and that type of thing. But it's very common for certain areas of the pasture or near a barn to be frequently used for rolling. Actually by my girl's barn there are areas of dirt that have been loosened up over the last year or so from them using it. They have spots where they seem to prefer to roll. Someone's excited. One of the things I find pretty fascinating about alpacas is the way that they graze. You can see that they stay in the general vicinity of each other and then they eat some grass. They'll take a few steps. 
They'll keep eating grass. We'll take a few more steps. And they'll just keep going. As a whole herd, they'll do this. And they'll just make their way through various areas of the pasture. Now this pasture down here is in excellent shape. All of this grass. The boys have the best pasture. They don't know how well they have it. <laughs> The alpacas are a very green animal, a very earth-friendly animal. You see the way that they eat? The way they, they pull on the grass to break it, but they don't pull it up from the root, which allows the grass to grow back. I mean, they're seriously just like oversized lawnmowers. On the bottom of their feet are pads, so they're very gentle on terrain. Their digestive system is very efficient. They have three stomachs, or a three compartment stomach, depending on how people want to describe it. But the food that they eat is processed three different times, very efficiently to get everything they can out of it. And then what they poop out is awesome for your soil, in your garden, in your house plants. You don't even have to compost it. You probably want to wait till it dries because the pee is what smells, but the poop them itself is virtually odorless. You can stand right over a big old poop pile and not smell a thing. Something else that makes them a green animal is they grow a renewable source. The fiber that they grow, we just shear it every year. They don't have to die for it, nor for us to get it. And they just keep growing a new crop for us every year. And on average, an alpaca will live for 20 years. My oldest right now is 21. And I don't know how long she'll be around, but she's not acting like she's interested in going anytime soon. Isn't it crazy that animals live off of grass? Now we get to go to the Shepherd's Mill. And throughout this presentation, I have slides introducing each new step of the process. So we'll be going back and forth between video that I shot and a PowerPoint presentation that Sally provided for me. And this would be the first slide. So it has all their contact information here if you are interested um, in using them to process your own fiber or if you'd like to visit, they have a retail store that uh, you'll see some of the products towards the end of the video. Um, but if ever you are in the Phillipsburg, Kansas area, be sure to stop by. There are windows in the retail store in which you'll be able to see the machines as they're working. You don't have to go into the room like I did to see how the mill works. You can see it there through the windows on your own and they're open to visitors being there. So here's their address, phone number, email, and also their website. I know at this time their website is under construction, so depending on when you watch this video, that website may or may not be functional. The first step is always shearing, which is up to the alpaca owners. 
Now the customer shears their own animals to collect the fiber which will be skirted before sent to the mill. Skirting is a process performed by hand to initially divide the fleece by quality and then to remove undesirable materials such as vegetation matter, which is hay, straw, weeds, and things like that, and any other matters that will not be used in processing the fiber. Next, there's receiving and sorting or grading. The fibers are received from the customer. The fiber type from alpaca to yak and color is identified. The fiber is weighed and graded with the grade based on the fineness of the fiber. The fiber length is measured and if greater than six inches long, it may need to be cut to shorter lengths depending on what the final product will be. If cutting, the fibers will be cut to less than six inches following washing. The fiber is also evaluated to determine if more skirting is required. The process from receiving of fibers to the final yarn product is expected to take approximately five weeks. So what we do when we look at whether we're combining batches or not is we look both at the length of the fiber and the fineness of the individual strands. And there is some difference in, these, in this animal. Um, especially here, and so this would be something that would probably be um, good to skirt, skirt out. out yeah. yeah, and you don't get it all. Uh, and there is never a time when somebody doesn't walk in with what they think is a well skirted fleece, and you know, it's perfect. my hand goes to the first <laughs> thing. It just that's just Murphy's law of fiber, I guess. Um, but as far as length difference, we strive to have no more than an inch and a half difference. So with this we've got just right at maybe an inch at the most. Okay. Um, so we'll be okay there. Um, this last shearing was a little coarser than these earlier shearings, um, but I think that with the de-hair we'll be able to sort that out and I'm not overly concerned between the difference there. Okay. This is what a big old bag of fiber looks like. Yep. It'll be ready to go through the de-hair. We'll wash it up first. So the washing machine is around the corner here. On to the washer. The washer can wash up to 18 pounds and three different colors of fiber per load. Completely automatic, but unlike a household washing machine, it does not agitate. If agitated, the fiber would felt and be unusable. Using 160 degree water and citrus based soap, alpaca can be washed in an hour and a half. Because of the lanolin or grease in sheep's wool, it can take as long as five hours to wash. So once we've checked it in, we put a weight on it, you've told us what you want done with it, then it goes in Mindy's pile for her to wash. What she's washing on right now is sheep's wool, I can tell. Um, and um, it's about, for alpaca or llama, it's about a hour and a half, two hour wash. For sheep's wool, it can be as much as five hours to get all the grease out of it. And then once she's got this spun out and ready, you'll notice there's three different bins. Mm -hmm. So if we're working with small batches, we can wash up to 18 pounds at a time. So if we've got six pounds of your white, six pounds of somebody's black, and six pounds of somebody's brown, we're still okay to wash them all together because there's no intermingling uh, between the bins. And that makes things go a little faster for us. So we use a citrus-based soap. Um, and it's usually either lime oil or orange oil or grapefruit oil that helps cut the spray down so, the... Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Then the fiber is taken to the dryer. After the fiber has been washed, it goes to the dryer to be dried on its own dry rack. There is a fan at the end of the three-door dryer that circulates air through the racks to dry the fiber more quickly. Fiber usually dries within 24 hours. So then it lays out on these dry racks, and we keep it separate by the letter on the tray um, and the number of the door. And she spreads it out as fine as she can across there. The air circulates through it. There is no heat. We don't want to uh, dry it down really fast necessarily. We just want it to dry it down to a consistent humidity. Just naturally air dry. Mm -hmm. Naturally air dry. And you notice uh, there's a few other colors in there. So. Like the Nope. Don't have any wool 
alpaca. This is all alpaca right here. So then once she's got it dry, then it goes over to the picker. And I know she doesn't have anything running in the picker right now. Next is the picker. While growing on the animal and while being washed, the fiber develops some matting. Here the fiber is pulled apart and fluffed to allow the other machines to function more efficiently. Uh, but it feeds in through these little in-feed rolls. Um, and then there's a drum in the middle on the inside that has inch-long teeth. And that's what actually pulls it through those in-feed rolls and fluffs it up as it goes. So if we open the door in here, it actually throws it into a room. We start, this is where we start to release the dust, and you can tell that. Then it moves on to the picker room. The picker blows the fiber into the collection room. When the fiber is picked and fluffy, conditioners are added to cut static and help the fiber hold together through the mill. Constant airflow through the collection room keeps the fiber from being damaged. Dust is also collected at this point. Um, we end up with a lot of dust on the walls. It smells very dusty. Yes, it does. Um, and there's your big teeth that pull that fiber apart. Uh, we add a little anti-static conditioner. Um, that's about the only thing we use anymore. So then once we've got it picked up and fluffed up, it comes out first to the dehairer. On to the dehairer. The fiber separator gently separates unwanted coarse guard hair, vegetation matter, and other contamination from fine fiber. Guard hair is the long coarse top coat hair which protects the soft undercoat of the animal. If not removed, the guard hair will cause itching and the end product will be less desirable. The unwanted materials are collected in chambers underneath while the prime fiber is discharged from the output end. The faster the machine runs, the more drops out. The slower the machine runs, the less drops out. The speed of the machine is adjustable and is determined based on the type of fiber and the amount of guard hair and debris per batch of fiber. Most likely, we don't dehair everything, but we do move um, probably up around 60-75% for sure. Okay. So this feeds in. He's actually at this point running the seconds or the waste product out of, out of a batch. So we'll run through the first time and then what's underneath will pull back out and try to save a second quality product or something that's similar enough to the first um, but still clean. And that's what he's doing here. It's a constant balancing act between quality and cost for most of our producers. We have some producers that want exceptional quality no matter how to put the cost. Others that are very cost conscious, which most of the time we don't even run for the deer. And then we have the balancing act in between. So it's a, it's a constant trying to figure out what these customers want. Next it goes to the carter. The carter is the heart of the fiber mill. It separates randomly placed fibers from each other and individually aligns these fibers, presenting them in the form of a continuous web at the output end. This web is turned into bats which are used in quilts and felt making. Alternatively, the web can be consolidated into rovings, long and narrow bundles, which are further processed into yarn. So then the carter is the main workhorse of the mill and um, so everything, everything we do goes to the carter. Um, some of it's de-haired before it comes here, some of it isn't. We do a measured feed between the blue lines on the belt and that's what keeps the inflow consistent so hopefully we have consistent outflow. Roving or 
the sliver. And we measure the number of yards going into a box um, so that we can match them up, hopefully equal them out, and let them go. Um, there's one more step after the carding before we spin to get as much consistency as possible. And so we'll take two or maybe even three of these rovings together so that if there's a thin spot, one hopefully it matches up to something a little bigger. We also stretch it about two and a half times so we get as much consistency and as much smoothness as possible. We're a semi-horsted mill, so we don't actually have the foam that locks yeah. the fibers up perfectly there. We're not a woolen mill either, so basically the loft of the fiber you tell you to turn into the loft of the cigar. Next is the draw frame. The draw frame further aligns the fibers, running them side by side, a process called parallelization, making a stronger, more consistent roving. Combining multiple rovings and stretching them two and a half times their original length improves the consistency for spinning at our spinning machines. Oh, neither one of these are running right now because they're waiting on the batches to come through, but this is the draw frame um, that we run to get as much Next is the spinner. On four or eight spindles at a time, each customer's fiber is spun to our exacting standards. We specialize in maintaining softness and loft while spinning all sizes of yarn, including lace, sport, worsted, and bulky. The spinner draws on rovings and directs them through a controlled system, outputting an extremely consistent fiber stream. Spinning at 20 yards per minute per bobbin, enough yarn for a pair of mittens, 240 yards can spin on 12 bobbins in a minute. So as the spinning is coming from the back, going through three sets of pressure rolls. As it goes down, the, the bobbins are what drives the speed um, and the twist. So we control every the, the twist going into every inch of that yarn is exactly the same. And then we're spinning it down as we, as we go. Then they go to the plier. The stream of yarn created is then twisted into a two ply or three ply yarn, most commonly. Yarn size, twist per inch, and production rate can easily be changed. If the customer requests blending, this can be done at any time throughout the process depending on what the customer wants their end result to be. Then to the steamer. While under slight tension, the plied yarn is pulled through a steam chamber, a drying tube, and then wound on a cone. Our quality control staff looks for defects which are cut out and the yarn is spliced pneumatically leaving no knots. This process sets the twist, much like a heated curling iron sets the curl in your hair.
Next is the skein winder. We return yarn on cones or in skeins. The winder creates a measured circle of fiber which, when removed from the winder, is hand twisted into a compact skein of yarn. Size of the yarn determines the number of yards in the finished skein. Shepherd's Mill has a computerized loom. Our once customized weaving services are now outsourced, giving us the ability to create woven product for retail outlets across the country in the form of scarves, shawls, throws, pillows, baby blankets, and much more. This is the video I took of the loom, but Sally was talking about something else, so I have slowed down the speed of the video so you can see it well, but I have removed the audio. Loom out of the custom processing business, um, and a friend of ours took over the custom weaving, and so now we do yarn, and they know what yarn they have when it's done, and then it goes to Brian, and he knows what it's going to cost to finish off the project. So um, that works a little bit better on the custom side of things. We're still doing some retail product. So what you produce here is what you sell yourself, right. the products you sell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we have a couple outlets, um, we have a couple producers across the country that take our stuff on a wholesale basis, so um, looking to build that a little bit, but mm -hmm. also just build direct into some retail stores as well. So. Yeah. yeah. So that's where we are right now. Everything is computer aided, so Sarah designs and punches it into the computer, and then the computer controls the lifting of the shafts um, so that there's less room for error, supposedly. <laughs> um, and then it's easier on her body, too, that the loom is doing the beating, um, so she can concentrate on making sure everything is happening the way it needs to. And then when things are finished and there's been a problem or two, um, and she'll go back and actually do the hand weaving to correct those and make sure things like that. So she uses her expertise differently now. <laughs>
You ready to talk about knitting machines? This is mine. It is the Brother KX350 mid gauge knitting machine. I acquired it a few years back. Um, I learned some pretty basic things on it. I made some hats and things, hats, scarves. I kind of, you know, played around with some stuff. Uh, then I think it's been about a year now since I've actually used it. And I told you last week that I had this project, this hand knit project of a baby cocoon that I'm doing as a gift. And I had done about this much of it by hand, hand knitting, and that I thought it was a good candidate for doing it on the machine. And it would save me some time. Since it was a gift, I wanted it done fairly quickly and sent back uh, so that they could have the gift and that I would be done with it and moved on to something else. And I had forgotten how much I enjoy machine knitting. It's actually pretty fun. And I want to say up front, hand knitting and machine knitting are two very different skill sets. Just because you can hand knit does not mean that you can machine knit. Uh, if you choose to do this, it's like learning a whole new fiber art. It's like you're going to weave or spin or crochet. You're starting from scratch. There are terms that are the same as hand knitting, but how you create your fabric, it's all different. Now, uh, being a knitter or a crocheter, you can use those skills on your machine knit items. That would be beneficial, but you actually don't have to have any knowledge of any other type of fiber art in order to machine knit. You can do everything on the machine. But in terms of some finishings, uh, like edgings or seaming and that type of thing, uh, you can use hand knit or crochet to complement the fabric that you've created here. It will give you more options in what your final project looks like. Now, uh, there are different gauges of machine. What I have is a mid gauge, so now, just like the term says, it's right in the middle, and it's going to handle hand knitting needle sizes four to ten. It will make anything you use on those needles like the yarn used on those needles you can use on this machine. So that's going to be worsted, sport, DK weight type yarns. And uh, then the smaller one than this is called a standard, which is the most common. You can think of that as needle sizes one through five. So it's going to handle the fingering and sport uh, lace weight. And um, yeah, you can do, like I said, those are a lot more common pretty much because more commercially made items are of a smaller gauge. And I did have a standard gauge machine for a small amount of time. Um, not everything was working on it right, so I did sell it. But also I realized um, I didn't like the small gauge of the machine. And I might have gotten used to it in time, but I had been working on the mid-gauge machine. And what makes these machines different is the spacing between the needles. I don't know if you can see that very well. I'm looking around for something put behind it that you can see better. You'll see uh, this better when I do a close-up of what I'm, how I'm actually creating my fabric here. But the sizing in between the needles is what makes the gauge different on the machines. Mine is seven millimeters apart. The standard is going to be 4.5 millimeters apart, mostly. I think there are a few standards that are a little, might be a little different depending on the brand, but in general, for the most part, it's four and a half millimeters. Even the mid gauge, it's a wider range. There's some six and a half, there's some eight millimeters. Um, is that right? Six, certainly six and a half. There's a six and a half millimeter, and mine is a seven, like I said. Then you have the bulky gauge, and you could think of that more as needle sizes seven and up. So it's going to handle worsted weight yarn and anything larger than that. The standard and the uh, bulky machines also come in metal beds. For the most part, they are metal beds. As you can tell mine is a plastic bed. Mine is considered a hobby knitter where uh, the metal beds are going to be more production knitting. If you wanted to do a business 
with your machine, then you're going to want a metal bed yeah, for the most part. I mean, you could start off with a plastic bed and work on your skills and build your business up to where you can financially afford a metal bed machine. Naturally, there are more. Um, but, you know, what you're going to see a lot out there is going to be the metal beds. And in the moment, I'll talk about where you can actually find this type of stuff. Now, since mine is a mid-gauge, and it's the only one I have, if you'd like to see the standard and bulky in action, Christine Kelly of U University did feature knitting machines in one of her episodes, and I will link that up in the corner and also down in the show notes. It was um, in the context of sock blanks. Her and her friend were going to make sock blanks. Her friend had a number of knitting machines. And so she went and interviewed her, and they get to talk about it. And you'll see the standard and the bulky. And in the studio where the machines are, that is more of a production knitting type of situation where she's actually making product on her machines to sell, which you can certainly do. I don't. I just do it right now for myself. I might dabble in selling items, but for right now, um, I have enough things to do, so that's not the case. For learning how to machine knit, there's a couple of places that I would recommend. Number one, YouTube. There is a lot, a lot of videos on YouTube about machine knitting. And if you're just kind of looking into it and you're kind of wondering what machine to get because there's a lot of models out there there's a number of brands a lot of models most of which are discontinued the vast majority of knitting machines you're going to find out there are used machines because they are no longer manufactured except for just a couple of companies you can still buy new knitting machines but for the most part what's available out there are the used ones that are no longer manufactured uh, including mine. This, like I said, this is a brother brand, but they no longer make it. If you look on YouTube, you can see people using the different models, and usually in the video they'll say, you know, what model, or at least what brand they're using. There's a lot of tutorials, uh, you know, pattern help type things. Even if you don't have a machine and you can't use the tutorial, you can actually just watch the person creating things with their machine, how it works, what different features there are. And like I said, you're going to be able to tell um, what machine it is. Either they tell you or on the carriage, it's going to say it. And if they are zoomed up close enough, you'll be able to read that. Um, but there are a lot of beginning videos on YouTube as well. Two channels that I would recommend, Roberta Kelly and Diana Sullivan. They both produce a lot of very well informed <laughs> videos on how to start and how to do a whole number of different things. Um, there are a lot of people now who make tutorials for knitting machines, so there's a lot of other people besides those two, but those are the two that I went to the most when I was learning, and so I would certainly recommend them. I last couple days I've uh, been watching YouTube for knitting machine videos for different things, and there are definitely a lot more people with those tutorials than back when I was learning. So um, you can certainly expand your scope beyond those two people. The other thing that has developed last year is on Craftsy, there is now knitting machine classes. And Susan, oh, I'm not quite sure how to say her last name. Guaglumi? I'm sure I butchered that really bad, and I'm so sorry, Susan. But um, you just read it down in the show notes. You'll see. It's there. There is uh, a class. I forget exactly what it's called. But there's a class that's very beginner for the knitting machine. And she actually uses a plastic bun machine just like this. The It's the Singer Reed LK150, which is the plastic mid-gauge machine you can buy today that is new. That is still being manufactured new. Uh, so if you prefer to buy new rather than used, and that's the one you're going to need to get. But that's the one that she does all of her demonstrating on, which means that everything she teaches you in that class, you can use on any type of machine. It doesn't matter the gauge, um, doesn't matter the brand, doesn't matter all the features. 
uh, that you'll be able to to take everything that she gives in that class. Then there's another class she does on hand manipulation because I have this machine here which is going to be very similar to the one that she demonstrates on. There are no bells and whistles on this one. As you look into standard and bulky, a lot of the models have additional features from what my machine has. So like back here there's going to be a whole set of different things, um, punch cards and a whole range of things that you can do. That mine cannot. <clears throat> Including a circular kneading, knitting, which would require you to have a ribber, which is really another bed like this, but it's faced here in front and the needles meet together. And so you have basically two beds working together to create a circular knitting situation. Me with just one flat bed, everything I create has to be a flat piece. And there are ways around it. There are tutorials like to make socks and things on a flat bed, which you can go see. There are some ways to do that. But the, oh, the hand manipulating, that's what I was talking about. If you don't have a machine that has bells and whistles, but you have one that's like this in which you have to hand manipulate your stitches, and you're going to see me do that here with this type of thing, um, then that second class will definitely be valuable. And I'm, I have not purchased it yet, but I certainly will in the future. It is in my plan. So I would really recommend the Craftsy course. I've now signed up to be a Craftsy affiliate. So the links down in the show notes, um, if you use those to register for these classes, I will receive a commission on that. It doesn't mean that you're charge anymore for your class. It just means that a portion of that will come to me since I referred you to Craftsweet to take the class. Um, you don't have to use the link. I'm just telling you, if you do, I receive a commission. Before we get on to finally using the machine, I wanted to answer the question of where do you actually get knitting machines. I imagine most of you don't have one. So as a first time machine knitter, you're going to want to buy a machine that you know is reliable. And the best place for that is from a retailer. I said earlier that most of the machines that exist today um, are no longer manufactured, so they're going to be used. But if you get used, even used, from a retailer, they would have gone over the machine. They would have cleaned, fixed, replaced anything that needed to be done. So you know that when you take it home, it is ready to go. You can also buy new ones from the retailers, of course, and um, like I said, do a Google search for ones that are near you, and I would highly suggest that you build a relationships with, relationship with those people, because in the future, if you have any issues with your machine, if something goes wrong, needs to be repaired, that is where you're going to go. All right, so if you're like me and you don't have a retailer near you, the ones closest to me are two states away, so obviously I'm not going to be going there. Um, I got mine on eBay. I would say that is probably the most common place to get knitting machines. You can get them from, shipped to you from around the world. Um, and with that, you really need to know what you're looking for. You know specifically about the model, when you're looking at the pictures to recognize that all the parts are there. Many things that are sold on eBay are sold by people that do not machine knit. They got them at estate sales or whatever. They're just things that they're selling. Um, they might not even know, they're not going to know if everything is there. But in the description, they're going to say that. And you need to be mindful that the seller does not know <laughs> anything about this machine. They, they read the name that was on the carriage or on the packaging, the box or something. Um, and that's all that they know. So you need to be mindful of, for that model, what are the parts that go with it and can you see them all in the picture and to be asking questions of the seller if this or that is there. Um, but knowing that anything you buy on eBay or any other online site, aside from a retailer, is going to likely need some maintenance. Um, like mine, it had been in someone's storage for who knows how long and I had to replace the, the strip underneath the, the tension strip underneath the machine here, uh, the job of that strip is to keep the tension on the needles as the carriage goes over them. And 
when that wears out either by use or over time it will break down then the machine is not going to knit properly because the tension is not there so in all likelihood when you buy online from someone that got it an estate sale or whatever that is definitely going to be something you need to do um, I since I had to t replace that strip I had to take out all the needles but that gave me a chance to look at all of them if all of them were in good condition, if the latches on all of them worked, if they were there, um, you know, they're not rusted or anything like that. So those are all things that you need to know if you're going to buy from online. Besides eBay, you could do Craigslist, another very popular option, or Facebook buy, sell, trade in your area. If you know what model you want or specifically like a gauge that you prefer to be using, you can do in search of on your local buy sell trade. I have done that and been successful. And that standard machine that I had gotten earlier uh, that I told you about that uh, I got that through Facebook. Now I was still pretty new and I didn't know how to fix what was wrong on it so I sold it because like I said, besides that and the smaller gauge, I just wasn't really into the smaller gauge, so I chose to sell it. On Facebook and Ravelry, there's also groups for machine knitters and some that are specific to sales. So machines and all of their parts, all the parts, the, I should say, attachments and accessories that come for some of the models that are out there. But like I said before, the best way for you to decide what you want, of course, is to read as much as you can on Google, but also on YouTube, watching people actually using the machines. You can see what they need to do to create different types of fabric and how they use different features on the machines, and you can decide what you like and what you don't like based on how they use theirs. And if you're just starting off, something like a Brother KX350, which there are a few of them available on eBay right now, or the Silver Reed LK150, um, those are both very good choices for beginners. They are less expensive than the metal bed ones, and it's a good way for you to kind of just learn and experiment on and decide if this is something that you'd actually want to invest in because machine knitting is not cheap. All of the machines and the attachments are much more pricey than hand knitting accessories. <laughs> Let's get into actually making fabric. When you machine knit, the machine is going to do stockinette. Just naturally do stockinette and it really only creates the knit stitch and what we get to look at is the back of the fabric so this would be the front as you can see and since I just have the flatbed no frills machine if I'm going to change anything so it's more than stockinette I need to hand manipulate so that is what I'm going to do here my pattern calls for the cable to be done every eight rows. So I've done eight. I don't know if you can see very well my row counter here is at eight. So you can see I've done eight rows here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the knits to purls, or on the side that we're looking at, we're changing purls to knits so that it creates the purls on either side of the cable. And this is how we get to do it. Here's some of the tools, transfer tools that you get to use with this. And what I'm going to do, it's on the edge, so it's going to, well, as we move through, you'll it'll be easier to see. So I'm going to put my latch hook. I should explain. Oh, now would be a good time to show you what a needle actually looks like. Can you see that there? So it looks just like this with the latch hook on it. So I use the latch hook tool to do exactly what the carriage does, what the machine does, but I'm reversing the process since I'm looking at the back. 
So I am putting my latch hook down in the last knit stitch. Well, to me, knit. <laughs> okay, then I pull out the corresponding needle. You can see that for this stitch. And I'm pushing it beyond the latch. So here's the latch. And as I pull back, the latch is going to close and the stitch is going to be loose and then on mine I give it a tug and you intentionally run you intentionally drop your stitch now depending on what yarn you're using if you pull on it it'll run really easily on this acrylic fabric that or acrylic yarn I'm using it does not move easily so I use that to help me out and so what I'm doing I am catching the bar of the row above into the latch hook and I'm pulling it through the stitch. So I am doing exactly the opposite of what the machine does, like I already said. And this can be done fairly quickly, especially as you get the hang of it. And once I get back up to the top, I will put it back on the needle up here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I have two on either side of my cable, so that's what I'm going to do. And then I'll come back when I'm ready to do the cable. Now that I have my knits into pearls on either side, I'm ready to do the cable up here. And the cable for this pattern requires two over two, but in my tools, I have two, and I have a three, and I have a three and a one. <laughs> so I'm using the two and the three, but only using two from the three, if that makes sense. Okay, so this is what we're doing. I am putting these two stitches, put those up to make sure they don't get caught, on this here and then I'm only getting two on this one again I like to make sure those latches are up this yarn is so splitty that I have to be careful with those latches okay so just trust me for my pattern <laughs> crossing correctly here so I'm really just transferring those two stitches over and of course my arm is in the way so sorry about that. Don't know how to do this without the arm being in the way. Okay, hopefully I'll have another shot to show you. Oh, I can show you on this one. Okay, so it's very easy to do cables because you're just transferring stitches onto different needles. Making sure, oh, nope, I blocked it again. Well, I'll try with my other hand this time. <laughs> okay. I know I'm not close enough for you to really see well. People who do the tutorials for this do a lot better job. Okay, so you can see I have two stitches on that tool. Again, I'm only trying to get two of the three on here, so it's a little more effort sometimes. Okay, now this one comes over here. And I have to guide those stitches under there make sure they get fully on there and I don't drop them because that would be horrible okay those are on there now and this one let me hold it with my left hand so you can see my arm won't get in the way that this time and I'm putting them on there okay now cable cables are crossed 
Okay, so I'm going to do that again here and here, and then I'll come back when I'm ready to move the carriage and show you how it actually knits. I have finished all my cabling and I'm going to knit, so I'm going to put some weights on here. This keeps the tension on the stitches and helps the carriage knit properly. Okay, I'm going to set my row counter back to zero because I'm only going to do eight rows. So let's show you how the yarn is going from the fabric. It goes through the carriage because this is the part that actually knits. And then it goes up into what's called a mast and this is what gives the tension. This will come up and down depending on where it's at, or where the carriage is at. So all throughout here, it creates the tension from this ball that's in the back. Now you can't use yarn in skein form with this. It needs to be in a ball. So you can tell I have a ball winder down here to regularly wind the yarn as I need to. You can see it has done eight rows and then I'm back to the place where I was when we started and so I'll do the reform. Wasn't that fun? I really enjoyed working with my knitting machine and it's fascinating the way it creates the fabric and at least with my machine then I have to reform things. I feel like it's pretty hands-on and it's still very creative. You really have to think through your mind has to think so differently from hand knitting that I find it a fun challenge. But I did want to bring up kind of a, a stigma that I've encountered about machine knitting from hand knitters. And I'm not quite sure where this idea originated, but there are some hand knitters who think that machine knitting is cheating. Like they'll actually call machine knitters cheaters. And all I can figure is that they have been told that it's cheating because anyone who's actually sat down and worked with a knitting machine would understand it takes skill and knowledge completely separate from hand knitting and that you'd never consider it less than hand knitting. It's just different. I mean, no one's going to tell a seamstress who uses a sewing machine that she's cheating because she's not hand sewing. I mean, you, you'd never call someone using a sewing machine a cheater. You'd never think that. So I don't quite understand where the idea comes from that machine knitting is cheating. And you saw what I had to do to my stitches to reform them. Uh, and you can imagine the work that goes into creating something on a machine that I don't feel like I'm cheating at all. I still really have to think things through and I still really have to use skill and practice. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, I'm just gonna leave it there. <laughs> but I am gonna show you what I did so far on the machine. This is the front panel of my cocoon that I took off. I still have an end to weave in here. But this is the front panel, and you can actually tell down here where I had hand knit. And then right about here is where I put it on the machine, somewhere in here. And you can tell up in this area how consistent those stitches are. 
And the gauge even looks a little different. I thought I started off with one gauge and I realized, oh, it's quite a bit bigger than here. Even though I had done a gauge swatch, apparently I chose the wrong thing. Oh, well. But, at, yeah, whenever I realized that maybe it was around here, then I went down in my tension gauge, my tension to make a smaller gauge. But once it's blocked, it's going to be just fine. And I'm, I'm not really concerned about the difference in the gauge. It's, it's going to work out just fine in the end. Now the front panel has this three by three rib flap that goes across the front. Um, so the whole panel, you know, is this. And on the machine, I'm looking at it this way. I think the hardest part with working on a knitting machine is you don't really see the beauty of your work because it's on the opposite side. And you saw me, I would often flip the end up just so I could see the beauty of what's coming out and appreciate it because, you know, working on the, the back of the work is not always fun. <laughs> but this is what I have so far. Um, and I talked to the people that I'm making this for and they actually wanted a larger size than what the pattern originally called for. So I'm going to have to put the bottom of this panel on and make it longer before I go ahead and do the back panel. But that, that will be good. I'm excited about that. Now, when I decided to do the knitting machine, I bought that Craftsy course, the basic, well, I should say a while back, I had bought the Machine Knitting Basics Craftsy course, but I actually started going through it to, as a refresher in order to do this panel, or the cocoon in general, really. Um, and I'm really enjoying the class. There's a couple of patterns that come with the class, uh, two scarves in particular that I know I want to do. So when this is done, there are some machine knitting projects that I want to continue with. So I'm looking forward to that. The other thing that I got done this week was more spinning. So as you can see, I have more yarn on my spindle and it's actually more consistent than down here. It's kind of hard to see in this lighting, but... Ah, there we go. Okay. So I've been winding it back up to the top. So this is my more recent stuff, which is a lot more consistent than say this stuff down here. So I am definitely getting better. And this is something that I also bought a Craftsy course for. There is one called Spindling. Now I can't say it's my favorite of the whole Craftsy line, but I definitely took away a number of things that improved my spindling. Um, and she covered different types of spindles too. So I'm kind of going, maybe I want to buy different spindles. But before I do, there's something else that happened this week. And that is I did go on eBay and found the piece to the spinning wheel that I showed you last week. That was the fake part, you know, cause there's no orifice here. Uh, but I found the right size on eBay of this part that is real um, and I ordered it. So we will see when it comes how that all works out. And I'm hoping too that this bobbin, let me take it apart. Okay. So that this bobbin I'm hoping fits the new flyer. It's possible that it will because I saw the measurement of the bobbin that comes with the new flyer and it's this same length, but we'll have to see it if it actually fits on the flyer and if everything works correctly. But I was like, there's nothing wrong with this bobbin. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this worked and I had an extra bobbin? I think that would be awesome. So, put it back on. So, Yes, that should be coming to me, but it's coming from Lithuania. So it will take at least a week and a half, a week and a half to three and a half weeks. There is like a big range of when it might come. So 
I'll have to be patient and do my other projects in the meantime. And if I really want to spin, I use my drop spindle. <laughs> so I'm still working on this skill. I've been working a lot in my studio this week making dryer balls. So I haven't put a whole lot of personal time into my Fiber Arts creations. But I did get... A little more caught up on my reading of the women's work book, The First 20,000 Years by Elizabeth Wayland Barber. Um, if you remember in my very first episode, I talked about this book because there is a reading group on Facebook for this book. I believe it's called the Textile Reading Group. I'll put the name on the bottom of the screen here because I think I'm missing a word. But this is a group that's hosted by um, Meadow of the Woven Road and Rachel of Treehouse Knits. Both have podcasts and they're guiding us through each chapter of this book. This week is chapter eight, so it may sound like you're way behind if you want to start in, but I think it's no problem if you wanted to start. You can start at any time. There's a post for each chapter so you can jump in on the discussion whenever you are ready. I am behind. I spent uh, some time yesterday reading two chapters. Which two am I on? Um, I did chapters five and six yesterday to catch up. Actually, I think part of four as well. Yeah, part of four as well. So I'm trying to catch up. Um, yesterday was a horrible weather day. Um, I'm in the Midwest. I'm in South Central Nebraska. There was actually snow in a lot of Nebraska yesterday. It just rained and drizzled all day. It was sleety. There was snow that fell in my area. It just didn't accumulate on the ground, thankfully. But we've had a la this last week of very overcast, rainy weather. And yesterday was just icing on the cake for bad weather. <laughs> But we need the moisture, so I am glad it is over. Today is sunny and beautiful. This week will be great too. And I brought up the weather to say yesterday was a bad weather day, but it was the perfect day to catch up on some reading. <laughs> that is going to be it for this episode of the Butterfield Alpacas and Five Arts podcast. Remember to enter the giveaway if you haven't already. And be on the lookout next week for a discussion about alpaca fiber where you will then be prepared to enter the Alpaca Cal. Have a great week. I will see you on the next episode.